Located over 2,200 miles off the coast of Chile, one of the most isolated places in the world, we have Easter Island, where the mainstream history tells us that the island has over 1,000 stone-carved massive heads, averaging 13 feet in height, that we are told were probably carved to commemorate important ancestors from around 1,000 years ago. Probably. Maybe. And I probably have some questions, and we're probably gonna shred this narrative. When self-proclaimed experts, people that were not there, just like you and me, these experts disagree with each other on when the island inhabitants first reached the island, while many in the research community think that they arrived in the year 800, 1,200 years ago. But the 2007 people think that they arrived in the year 1,200, 800 years ago, when those people in the 800s were, of course, master stone carvers out in the middle of the ocean, just to show appreciation to their ancestors, which we all do today, of course. So then the mainstream just skips hundreds of years ahead to the year 1722, leaving out a 900 to 500 year timeline gap because nothing important happened for 900 years. And we have this fully documented. No. When 1722 hits, the Europeans arrive, of course, and find these two to 3,000 people living in the middle of the ocean. And this is when they basically kill them all and rewrite the mainstream history to what we read today. In my opinion, this 1722 date that we are given was more realistically closer to this 1877 date down here at the bottom. Because literally 11 years later, in 1888, Chile annexed Easter Island by forcible acquisition over one's territory. So we have some very trustworthy things happening here. Lots of nice meetings, some great discussions, some murder, and some land takeovers. We have a group of people that now have complete and total control of the narrative. That seemed like a great bunch, a group that we should fully trust and go the extra mile for. And giving this answer would give you an A on your college social studies exam. It would also be ridiculous in the real world when we can clearly see that they have 100% drilled a lie regarding Easter Island into our heads since 1888. And this is when we take it up a notch. When in 2020, until 2022, for two years, they shut this place down to the public. Nobody could go in there for two years. And then from August to October, just two months after the island was reopened to the public, a forest fire burned nearly 148 acres of the island, causing irreparable damage to the stone statues, where a random arson is suspected, but will forever be a mystery. Two months after they opened it back up, some random individual lights the whole island on fire. Really? And we have no idea who did this? What are the odds of that? Also, how much of this place is really something that can be ignited? These stone structures that are most likely bigger than we can see and just buried under the ground. And this fire doesn't make any sense at all when thinking logically because they tell us that the fire was in an area where several hundred of these stone structures were as well as the stone quarry where the stone used to carve the sculptures is extracted, lighting a bunch of stone on fire. Are we all following what is being said here? They're telling us that this random individual somehow ignited a bunch of stone. Do you understand how hard this would be to go to this island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and light the place on fire and get away with it? And is anybody surprised that there is now a fire narrative attached to these incredible statues? Yet another fire. And we know that stone is one of the worst options to throw into your bonfire. Have any of us successfully started a fire using just stone, grass, and dirt. There really aren't any trees on this island. In fact, I don't see one. It's basically grass and stone. So they destroy the main site where these massive stone structures came from. And then we can't forget that these people from the 800s were also able to carry these 1,000 replicas that weigh over 10 metric tons right on over to their ultimate resting place. Oh, did I say replicas? 
Do I think that this was an island filled with giants that were possibly killed off in 1888? Where we have clear evidence of the mud flood, even on a random island in the middle of the ocean, where it seems like a layer of dirt was thrown over the top of the entire map that we live on. Like the oceans rose up and brought mud with it, with the waters then going back down, but leaving the mud behind. And we have seen this all over, including in our Boots on the Ground playlist. Speaking of maps, are you ready to see this map that I found? A map from the Chilean government in 1870, with additions and corrections 16 years later, when we all know about Tartaria at this point. A land that none of us were taught about in our mainstream history classes growing up. Right here on Easter Island, right next to this bay, we have Tatara. Has there ever been a bigger time in history that we have wanted to zoom in on a location on Google Earth? and see what is there. I threw these two maps over the top of each other to line up the exact location for us. I lined up this bottom corner, this circular spot with each other, and then went from there. And it looks like we have located Tatara Easter Island, and it's time to have some fun, where we have just located the crowned statues and two massive mounds, where we all know about the mounds from our St. Louis episodes, where we have found the monk's mound that has a temple two feet under the dirt. Could these be massive temples under the grass located in Tatara Easter Island next to the line of crowned statues? If I was allowed to dig for treasure anywhere in the world, I think I know where I would go. And it's also so clear and obvious that since 1888, the mainstream history is 100% lying to us, manipulating us with false stories because we all know and can see the original map from the 1800s. It says Tatara, and now of course, it's no longer named that. In fact, they changed the names of every single one of these locations in the last 150 years. What was wrong with the original names? Well, they gave away too many clues. Where we also have Matu Tantara, and we know that this is where Tatara Easter Island is located. We just saw this spot on Google Earth. Well, 150 years later, let the mainstream narrative get their hands on a story. And now it's called Anakana Beach. So we have proof of history being rewritten in the last 150 years. Total manipulation, where they tell us that this was the first replica to be raised back into place by using those incredible wooden levers in 1955 back into place. What do you think they did with possibly the most important part of Easter Island before 1955, where they have seven of these replicas and two of which have deteriorated? Or in other words, and in my opinion, two have been destroyed. It's an unusual location for Easter Island where it is one of two locations where there is a sandy beach. This is a clear indication that this location of Tatara was the main location of the island, a port where these individuals were able to come and go to and from the island. The rest of the island is a rocky coastline, meaning that these were most likely man-made beaches. And this sentence is a clue for us to dig deeper, where they say that islanders read from these rongorongo boards, where we have located possibly something incredible. These were seized, and most of these tablets were lost or destroyed in the 1860s. Unbelievable. And at this point, the mainstream narrative is on the ropes. This is so in your face that we have been manipulated and completely lied to. Our mainstream history is 100% fabricated and controlled, destroying the writings in the 1860s, when at the exact same time, we are told that in the 1860s, this was when the population of Easter Island was depleted and the Chilean government annexed the island 20 years later. Incredible, where we get a tale of their destruction. And remember, this story is most likely complete nonsense, but it says in 1868 that the Bishop of Tahiti was given the wooden boards covered in this hieroglyphic writing and none of the natives were capable of translating the writing. Well, they weren't capable because they were all dead from the Europeans. So of course they couldn't translate anything. And this is when we're told that they say they had hundreds of tablets four years prior and now couldn't find them. And the locals were dead. So they burned them as firewood. Could you even imagine 
the information that was destroyed and hidden from us in just the last 150 years. From the writings that we do have, they prove that the wood that had writings on it that were supposedly found at Easter Island weren't originally from Easter Island. In 2007, Catherine Orliak, through examination, proved that the wood wasn't from native land. It wasn't from Easter Island, showing that the wood was actually from South Africa, yellow wood, and therefore that the wood had arrived with Western contact. And this means, in my opinion, that these are just fakes. They are literally a bunch of children scribbles to try and trick us into thinking that they were primitive cavemen that accidentally made some massive stone carvings and then go over in the corner and draw like a two-year-old. When I guarantee you that the originals that were burned in yet another fire were elaborate and gave away a history, a lot of knowledge that isn't being shared with us or with our future generations. I think that in the future, whenever you are told this tale of hieroglyphs from an ancient civilization that look like they drew it with their left hand and with their eyes closed and blindfolded, you should be very careful believing that as factual information. Being able to carve massive stone structures perfectly over and over but they can't draw it on a piece of paper we all understand in architecture before a building is created even a small house before it's here physically we have to first draw it up if you can't draw the building or the house isn't going to turn out any better drawing like this and then knocking out a thousand of these is not logical thinking that does not add up. So we know at this point that the real Ron Garango texts, the true ones, are not being shown to us. And I bet they didn't actually burn them in a fire. I bet you they still have them. Oh, and one more thing about the 1860s. After they wiped these people out, they took one of these replicas back to London, where it has been described as a masterpiece. Yet they supposedly draw like two-year-olds, where the name was given to it by the British crew that took it, translating to stolen friend. Incredible. And it's time for possibly the best part and to tie this whole thing together. Here we go. I have located an article from the 1964 Oregon State Daily Barometer uncovering some information that should make this episode one to remember, where we know that the Tartarian Empire was located in Central Asia. And we also see this on many maps, where we also know that Easter Island holds possibly the most important part of the island, named Tatara. And then we have this article from 1964, where it reads that Easter Island has caused worldwide disagreements over its origins of people. Some experts believe they came from Asia, which would tie them directly to Tartaria, which I normally don't agree with what the self-proclaimed experts have to say. But the article goes on to give us a second option of where these people came from, where the others claimed that South America was where they came from a thousand years before them. And we all know which narrative was chosen to be taught to us today. And it wasn't the Tartaria connection one. Now both may be false, but one connects the story and that's the same option that was left out of the storybooks that we are all taught today. And we're about to expose something that is 100% not shown to us in the mainstream history. A place that 99% of us have never heard of that's in an article from over 100 years ago. And this is when the article tells us that when these were first discovered, they appeared to be heads above the ground. However, after excavation, some were found to measure 40 to 50 feet long or taller than a four-story building. And somebody was asking the right questions in 1964. When they ask, how were these carved, transported, and erected on a secluded island without metal or trees? And I think we know now that there was a much more advanced, most likely much bigger group of people that were here before us. And I don't believe it was that long ago. 50 foot tall giant statues, over 1000 of them. And in my opinion, replicas, absolutely incredible stuff. And this goes even deeper where a 1925 article from the Courier Journal gives us a map of a massive land called Mew. And it says the map is showing the supposed position and extent of Mew after 
Hawaii and Easter Island had been separated from it, where people migrated to Mexico and over to Asia. It also goes on to say the crosses on the map are the locations of stone monumental remains of the land of Mew. Okay, so we definitely know that there was more land here. And this is about to get really interesting. When it reads, in this land of Mew, according to Colonel Churchward, this was the Garden of Eden, the spot where Adam and Eve of mankind's beginnings lived. Now it tells us that this information is coming from ancient tablets, where he and an East Indian temple custodian have succeeded in translating, and this all coming to us in 1925. So seven years later, in 1932, we have the San Francisco Examiner also mentioning this continent of Mew, giving us another map. Now, whether we believe that this continent was real or not, this is still information. When I find something that could give us clues for the future, I am not gonna withhold it from everyone. That being said, this would make a lot of sense since there is a massive amount of space between the Americas and Asia, Australia in the Pacific Ocean. If this land was there, I don't believe that it was 13,000 years ago like they're telling us. I would say it's much closer to our timeline and possibly sank and possibly sank when the mud flood worldwide took place. And this would definitely explain why they are finding these massive stone structures and pyramids under the water and would explain where the Mayans came from and why they have stories regarding the destruction of Mew. And in this article, it goes even deeper into this narrative where it tells us that this colonel went to central India and met with a high priest in a temple school monastery where the priest in the 1800s showed him some extremely ancient tablets which had been hidden for thousands of years in the temple vaults proving, in my opinion, that these groups of people hold the knowledge they know our true history and are 100% hiding it from us. The mainstream history that we are all told today, in my opinion, is a totally different narrative than what really took place here. And within this same article, we are told that an American archeologist discovered in Mexico, the ruins of three great cities. The city was covered with a foot of earth. And at the bottom of the article, saying that it was destroyed by a flood, showing more evidence of a worldwide mud flood, like we have mentioned. And we all know about Plato and how he mentioned the land of Atlantis. So I went and found a final article for today, an article that may give us a much clearer idea of where Atlantis really was and what it was really called. An 1899 article predating the 1925 article by 26 years from the St. Louis Globe. As we zoom in on this paragraph, we can see that it says that a doctor has spent 12 years in Yucatan studying the Maya language and digging among the ruins where he has made some famous finds, where he says that the Mayans had the original Isis, the original Osiris, and the original Sphinx. They had a highly developed language before Sanskrit, where the Mayans lived in splendor long before and long after that strange land, the land of Mew, which Plato has called Atlantis.